we will start with Kirsty Wallis, uh, who represents the Office for Open Science and the Scholarship. Kirsty is the head of research liaison at UCL. She's responsible for managing a number of teams with research support responsibilities, including RDM and bibliometric teams. She also, she's also the internal lead for open science at Bocas. Our second speaker would be Gemma Moore from the Evaluation Ex Exchange. Gemma is a senior research fellow at the Institute for Environmental Design and Engineering at the Barley. She leads the Evaluation Exchange, creating a model of engaged evaluation, capacity building for postgraduate students and voluntary sector organizations. Our third speaker is Muki Hackley, co-director of the UCL Extreme Citizen Science Group. Muki is a professor of Geographic Information Science Department of uh, uh, the Science Department of Geography, University College London. He has contributed to policy formation through reports, discussions, and briefing. Our fourth speaker is Anne Leiborn, who is responsible for managing the Community Research Initi Initiative for Students, CRIS. Established in November 2018, CRIS seeks to encourage engaged research between the communities with UCL uh, seats uh, and its academics. This is done through supporting master's students to start the journey towards collaboration with community partners for their dissertation research projects. Our last speaker is Artemis Scarlatidu, who is our lecturer in, cit in citizen science in the Department of Geography at UCL and the People Nature Lab at UCL East. She has extensive, extensively researched trust issues and public perception in various contexts of public engagement and information provision. Her research interests include human computer interaction and user experience of geospatial technologies, risk communication, uh, philosophical and ethical issues for the appropriate and effective use of public engagement technologies. We will be able to take some questions after the talks or you can post your questions on Twitter. Thank you very much. And Kirsty, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that uh, really nice introduction. Actually. Um, so I have actually got the easier job of the day, which is actually um, context setting mostly. Um, so as part of the Office for Open Science and Scholarship, one of the things that I do is I look after the whole breadth of open science, of which citizen science is a part. Um, so I'm just going to be talking you through some of the, um, the background for the office and how citizen science um, falls into it and what we do to support it. Um, so the Office for Open Science and Scholarship a um, little bit of background, launched back in October 2020, um, and it is based in library culture collections and open science, formerly known as library services. Um, it's governed um, from the top by the UCL Open Science Committee, and that's chaired by um, our Vice Provost for Research. It is underpinned and built upon um, the eight pillars of open science that were um, published by a group called LERU, who, which is the League of European Research Universities. Um, they're here on the screen. I'm just going to quickly spin through them because it's mostly just all for context. So um, Future of Scholarly Communications is all about open access and developing um, different ways of making things open and available to whoever wants it, needs it. Um, FAIR data is exactly the same, but as it pertains to data and um, other scholarly outputs. Next generation metrics, that is looking at ways of measuring um, these outputs that we're generating um, in fair and equal manners, um, but also new ways of um, recognising um, the reach of some of these works. So this is where things like alt metrics come into it. Um, got citizen science in there. Hopefully you guys will all know what that, that one is. Um, next up, there's education and skills and rewards and initiatives. So I tend to describe these together um, because they are all about making sure that everybody that we interact with has the appropriate skills, the appropriate initiatives, and that they are actually rewarded for embracing all of the other stuff that we talk about. Um, under these pillars also uh, comes 
uh, open education. So um, open as it relates to the learning and teaching side of things. And finally, we have uh, research integrity, which comes under there and something called the European Open Science Cloud, which is actually um, a Europe wide, now kind of a worldwide infrastructure project um, that we are basically keeping a watching brief on. But you can see how this very broad remit has citizen science right at the centre. So overall, the office itself, the point is to support the internal community at UCL in adopting all of these open practices and approaches that I've just very briefly spoken about. So a lot of the work we do links directly with all of the different stakeholders across the university at all levels. So students, staff, um, professors, people that work in labs, libraries, doesn't matter. They're all our stakeholders and we really want to work with all of them to set the direction and the strategy for open science. We do a lot of work to advocate best practice, create a lot of resources that are then shared openly. Uh, we do a lot of events, training, workshops. We have an annual conference. Um, and then if that was not enough, um, we also have this additional goal, which is actually to take what we are doing internally um, and advocating and sharing that as broadly as we can. So by joining in and doing things like this and talking about what we do. Going back to citizen science, um, I just wanted to show a little bit of the operational plan. So this is publicly available. It's There's a link on the screen that you can go and read it for yourself. But um, just to show that of the 15 objectives, these on the screen are all of the ones that link directly to citizen science. The ones in grey are all encompassing. So they're things like identifying best practice and establishing a program of training. So that will apply to every single pillar. But these ones at the bottom are actual objectives that apply directly to citizen science projects. So creating that central point of contact, which we've done in the library as part of the office. Um, promoting the citizen science activity, increasing the collaboration and the community around the projects that already exist, um, and then <coughs> establishing best practice guidelines um, for creating these projects. So these are all things that we either have done, are doing, or in the case of the last one, should be working on very shortly. Um, so we're very, very proud to have citizen science that embedded in the work of the office. And just finally talking about the breadth of what this encompasses, um, you will see in the coming talks a little bit more detail about this, but the work that we are doing inside the office is not by itself. It is built upon all of the projects and groups at UCL that have citizen science expertise. Um, so you will be hearing from members of the Excites Research Group. They have all really, really contributed to this. Also, um, we work very closely with colleagues in the Institute for Global Prosperity, um, and they have been a big, big supporter of what we're trying to do here as well. Um, we have a citizen science working group that has come out of this work, um, and that supports something called the UCL Citizen Science Academy, um, which operates in the local area around um, UCL in Bloomsbury. Finally, one um, little thing about the, the central point element, um, which is that what we're doing is we are trying to not to replace the work that is being done out in the wider university. The purpose of it is to be a central point for the support and liaison aspects. Um, so the idea is that we are going to be creating resource and a coordinator for citizen science at the university um, so that the support for these projects but also support to create them um, can be centralized and standardized and there can be someone who will be able to link different projects together different areas of expertise together so that the individual academics themselves can get on with the wonderful, amazing research that they do. 
Um, and so on that, let's hear about some of the wonderful research that they do. And I'm going to hand over, well, I'm going to hand back to Abra because I can't remember who's next, sorry. Thank you, Kirsty. It was a really great presentation. Now it's the turn of Gemma. Yeah, thanks, Kirsty. That was great to give the context and to zoom right the way out. So what I'm going to do is actually zoom into a very specific project and program um, called the Evaluation Exchange. And so within the 10 minutes I've got, which I'm just going to also put on a timer so I stick to time, I'm going to give you a little bit of context about the Evaluation Exchange programme, as well as telling you what it is and what it does as a as a program and then because of the the this uh, umbrella we're in about digital skills and action I've also uh, it had a bit of reflection about how does the evaluation exchange encompass some of those ideas as a program because actually it wasn't set up as a digital action program so I explained a bit more about that in my presentation okay so here we are let me just uh, put that on. Okay, if you can't see anything, please, please let me know. Okay, so the Evaluation Exchange is a, a capacity building program, and it builds capacity both uh, for researchers as well as voluntary sector organisations. And it's a program run out of the Bartlett here at UCL, and I'm a researcher at the Bartlett, and a lot of my work is around, uh, is around issues around health and sustainability, but actually most of my work is probably about the processes of how do we engage different perspectives and knowledges to come up with solutions. Um, and so the Evaluation Exchange fits with a lot of my research skills, but is a programme that we run with two infrastructure bodies, and I'll explain a bit about them late, later, but they are our, our partners in delivering the programme. So as I said, today I'm going to give a, a little bit of context about the Evaluation Exchange and where it's come from, as well as what it does and the reflections about the digital aspects of the programme. So why are we here as the Evaluation Exchange? And so um, as Kirsty's pointed out under the lens of open science, is we've also got within the university's strategies an idea of being a publicly engaged university. And back in 2014-15, UCO announced its expansion into East London as well. So building a whole new campus into East London. And they wanted to do that with the community at the heart of that decision making and making sure the campus would be engaged with those local contacts and communities. And so for them, it was really important to think about the partnerships that we have within our local neighbours, but also in London as a whole. And UCL has a, a London office, and a lot of the work it does is around establishing those partnerships, and those partnerships should be about mutual benefit. So benefit to the youth university, but also to think about what are the benefits to the, the organisations and sectors that we're working with. The other aspect of uh, why we're here and why the evaluation exchanges here is there's been a shift to think about more engaged educational practices uh, and I know Anne's going to talk about the student experience and the role of that but as a university I think over the last 10 years there's been some pedagogical changes in thinking about how can we skill our researchers through education to think about wider career development and wider application of their knowledge in society. That's why we're here as a university. But as I said, the programme, the Evaluation Exchange um, also has this voluntary sector angle. So building capacity outside the university. And so what happened um, when UCL announced it was going to move into East London? Uh, we spoke to some of our voluntary sector uh, partners about what the university could do. And many of them came back with seeing the overlap between the research skills the university has and the need for building evaluation capacity within those organisations. And many of those organisations are under an increasing amount of pressure to demonstrate what they do and to be accountable for the funding that they have and give clear evidence of the difference they make, so the so what of their work. 
and the so what to the beneficiaries that they, they work with. They also spoke about how actually their evaluation capacity was really focused on a project by project basis, so really driven by the funders need, but actually they wanted more coherent approaches to evaluation in their organisations thinking about not just monitoring at this granular level, but how can we understand the wider difference that we make as an organization and also ensure that that difference turns into action. So how can we learn from the projects that we run? So this was a real driver and, and the heart of the evaluation exchange. And again, thinking back to those motivations around mutual benefit, it was seen as an area where there could be an overlap for where UCL could work with many of these voluntary sector organisations. And I mentioned the term evaluation capacity building and because I'm an academic, I've put up a quote on there, but I won't spend too long. And I think the key bit of that quote is about building sustainable evaluation practice, which is the middle bit of the quote, and having, I guess, systems and approaches where evaluation isn't just an add-on, it's, it's integral to what you do, how you think about things and your running of your organisation or your project or program. So the context of the evaluation exchange, so it built on a, a relationship, first of all, in East London between a voluntary sector infrastructure body and UCL. And as I said, it came from this idea of a need for evaluation support within the voluntary sector, but also tying up with those opportunities for students to have this experiential learning. And so we piloted this programme matching PhD students here at UCL with voluntary sector organisations in Newham and we've we've developed into into Camden and so what I'm going to talk about a bit is how we've run this program again both in Newham and Camden we've had over the last year around 50 PhD students and early career researchers involved in the program matched in teams really multidisciplinary teams working with 13 organizations in Newham and Camden and so we deliver this with two infrastructure bodies. I'm here talking about the programme, but there's a team of seven of us that deliver this. And so we have support within Newham and Camden with, it, with Compost London and Voluntary Exit Camden, who provide increasing amount of knowledge and brokerage with those 13 groups that we, that we work with. And that's really at the heart of it because they provide that knowledge and that legacy for the programme once our, our funding comes to an end. So again, I've got to rush about what it actually is. That was the context. So we, as I said, it's a capacity builder program. It has one aspect about training up and building skills for PhD students. So putting their skills into practice in a real life setting. Those PhD students and early career researchers are matched with a community group who respond to a need that is set by the community group around an evaluation challenge. And they work together for a period of six months to, to address that challenge together. So it's a learning and capacity building on both sides. And this fits within the Bartlett in lots of ideas around the ethos of the Bartlett where I'm based, around ideas of the co-production of knowledge and wider uh, discussions around engaged scholarship. So how do we put research skills into practice and knowledge into action? And what we know, what happens from this programme, is that for the PhD students involved, it's a great experience to develop their skills and to create networks within the PhD community uh, across lots of different disciplines. Within the community groups involved, and they're very diverse in the issues that they face, this is a homeless charity we work with, they have, from being involved in this programme, systems and processes uh, to capture and understand the impact of their work. And this enables them to reach out and obtain more funding for they, their work. It also enables them to push back from funders about the evaluation they might be asked to do. But it really embeds this idea of an impact culture within those organisations. And I guess as a whole, thinking about that idea around engaged scholarship, and which is promoted within the Bartlett Ryan base, it has this broader remit of allowing and thinking about the broader societal challenges um, that the research should, should be addressing. So that's what it does, that's what it's where it's come from. Uh, and we've got, we have this lovely um, 
uh, Visual Illustrator come to one of our workshops that we, we did because we have a structured training program throughout those six months. And I think this really captures the essence of the evaluation exchange. Just in my last minute, I was going to reflect upon delivering this program, which is all about relationships. It's all about building trust. But how do we deliver it during the pandemic, which has enabled us to shift? We had to shift to deliver it digitally. So we went for this online delivery. And so our structured program of training as a big cohort, which was in our pilot, all together in the room, spending the whole day together, was delivered online. We had a lot of creative activities we did previously where people were building things from arts and crafts. So we had used loads of different online tools to try and recreate that. We introduced different platforms, online platforms to, um, to, to again, to help with that team building. So we use Microsoft Teams. But we also found that from doing delivery on the pandemic, some of the groups were coming back to us with additional re requests about the training that they wanted. So we put on extra training around video making and using digital tools in their uh, in their work. We also noted actually that. Yeah, sure. I have oh, hello. I think you're. Yeah, you're now. You're muted. That'd be great. Thank you. I'm just sorry, finishing Gemma. Now. We also need to finish. Sure. My final thing then was about what, how this shift to digital led to actually more collaboration because we had students participating from outside the UK. We had innovative solutions that came from the challenges set uh, and this exposure to different ideas because we hosted a lot of it online. And as I say, one of the benefits of online was about that inclusion and reach of diversity of perspectives. So it actually helped us achieve some of our broader aims. Sorry for going a minute over. Okay. No problem. Thank you very much. And thanks for telling us more about the evaluation exchange. Uh, our next presenter is Muki. Muki couldn't be here, but we have a re recording of his presentation. I think we cannot hear the presentation, Artemis. Second. Artemis, if you stop sharing and then Hello. we share. Oh, no, he's, he's talking. I'm going to talk about the development of teaching at UCL around citizen science, in particular on our postgraduate level module, Introduction to Citizen Science and Scientific Crowdsourcing. But to start with, I will give a bit of a background how we got into the position of starting with teaching citizen science. So my personal background is that I've been doing participatory action research for a very long time um, and worked together with postgraduate students, with uh, PhD students uh, over the years on different projects from working with communities around uh, issues of environmental information to uh, exploring crowds for geographical information and many other things. In all these cases, and I learned that in those areas you learn by doing. So you have to be involved and you have someone to guide you with the practices of it. It doesn't work to teach only from a specific book or from a lecture and then go out into the world. You actually want to engage with the process. And that's something that I do also a lot in my research. I participate in a lot of citizen science projects, not just writing about them and studying them from the outside. And that provided an ability to combine theory and practice as a way to assist learners to understand concepts and practices. So I've done it in different cases. Here, just one example of it from a talk at an OpenStreetMap conference of pointing out that if you want to research OpenStreetMap, you better study it and be a mapper first in order to understand how it works. 
So in terms of the experience specifically in citizen science, um, I was starting to run different activities around citizen science, specifically beyond more uh, participatory mapping around 2007, eight. And that evolved into different requests to have seminars and talks about it. And around 2010, I was finding myself talking more and more about citizen science. And by 2011, there were requests to integrate talks about crowdsourcing and things like uh, open street maps or crowdsourced geographical information into a lecture. So that's just one lecture within a wider course. By 2013, I was giving a UCL open lecture, a public lecture on citizen science as a result of different projects that we developed here at UCL. And by 2016, that was the beginning of the idea that we can have an MSc in citizen science to create people with the right skill for this area. But 2017, as a way towards this wider program, uh, I designed and started to deliver a year later a postgraduate module, Introduction to Citizen Science and Scientific Crowdsourcing, which we'll talk about. And later on, there was also the development of specific uh, training modules within the EU Citizen Science pro for platform and all sorts of other informal teaching of MSc and PhD students. And all that experience was integrated into what you're saying. So where it is coming from and why I've got into teaching citizen science. So where I'm coming from is that I'm working within a practice that we call here extreme citizen science, which is highly engaged and participatory. But in order to explain to people what is extreme citizen science, which is at the extremities of the practice of citizen science, you need to explain, first of all, what it is citizen science. So you can't assume that people know about it. And actually, most of the audience never heard about citizen science and what it is. Even when people heard about citizen science, it's very likely that they have a very specific disciplinary or a very partial understanding of what the whole practice involved. So what are the learning objectives in terms of teaching is, is to explain that citizen science is a very complex socio-technical object that need to be learned. So there is uh, issues with software, with uh, information communication technology infrastructure, with data quality, with volunteer management, with recruitment and engagement, and with all sorts of other issues. And therefore, if we want to teach someone about it, and especially taking into account that they never heard about it, we want them to understand and to participate so they can think like a volunteer or like a participant. So that's where the uh, design came from. And that's, for example, demonstrated in an ongoing process. And those are just some of the slides that I've been using in trying to explain what it is, this extreme citizen science. So say, after I've explained where normal citizen science is, I'm explaining where is the extreme citizen science. You can see the first presentation of it in 2010, a presentation from 2011 that was too much highlighting a form of a ladder of a hierarchy, which is, wasn't the intention of it, and then developing it in different ways, also explaining what the geographical citizen science is. So out of all that, an iteration of uh, explanation evolved different ways, which I noticed during presentations work well. For example, an overview of the field of citizen science in such a way that both integrate the narrative, the historical narrative, the technological narrative, and also the participatory narrative into one way where we can go through the different types of citizen science and not just tell people about the types of citizen science, but also give them examples of each activity. Another example is the narrative that goes around the development of higher levels of education over the year 
and the changes in put in science and in public participation in science over the years. So that led to the development of the introduction of citizen science and scientific crowdsourcing at UCL. It was suggested uh, in 2017, as I mentioned, and started in January 2018. It's a full-scale MSc-level course. It's designed around 10 weeks with two hours of lecture and seminars, but one hour practical and two assignments that um, of about 1,500 words each. Um, one of the ideas that was important for the course was to make sure that it's an open course, so it's available on UCL Extend, the open learning website of UCL, so anyone can access it, and it's suitable for online learning or class-based, or a mix between it, which came as a good blessing during the pandemic especially. And it's demonstration of the different interest in citizen science. The cost structure is actually interestingly, um, what I learned over those lectures is that uh, we do it upside down. We don't start from the theory and then going into the practice because people don't have yet a concept of what it is that citizen science includes. So we start with a lot of demonstration and hands-on experience so the student can start building up the understanding of what is citizen science and then we can build up the understanding. It was also important to make it cross-disciplinary. So it's to provide general introductions so anyone from any uh, faculty at UCL can join in and learn it. And that also reflects itself in the learning objective that you see here. So the general structure of the course is that it starts with some background of history, the apologies, explaining what crowdsourcing is and what environmental citizen science is. That's the first part, which provides you with a lot of introduction. And as I said, each week the students are doing something like using online citizen science and more complex a technical citizen science uh, to do it as, an, as a way to learn. The second part is dealing with what I lots of time call the data quality monster, the claims about the quality of citizen science, where it comes from, uh, data management, uh, digital technology design and volunteer management. So that's actually organizing and running citizen science so people can understand that. The third part is dealing with ethics, policy, and evaluation, and getting now into the philosophy of science and social theory to explain. Sorry, everyone, for the technical problem. And finally, there is also the elements of uh, participating in different activities from starting with clicking on Penguin in Zooniverse to ending up with a uh, full app design. And the assignment is both technical on technology design and then on the theory and the practice. The class structure is always start with a prep video where students can watch it online before the class. There is always some reading where we split it into core reading that they have to read in order to prepare to the class. And additional reading, which is something that they are expected to use in the assignment, and a deep dive, which if someone is very interested in it. The lectures themselves online are broken into three or six parts, so they can uh, be watched like this lecture. And there are quizzes and other reflection questions in each unit. And the text and the slides are available online, so students can use them. And I've used a, diff a slightly different uh, version uh, in class to talk different points. The uh, lessons from it was that actually it is surprising that already in this field, it's really difficult to figure out what you select just for uh, 30 contact hours. You need to think through uh, because the field is already big and complex. And that was somewhat a surprise. I thought that it might be challenging to think about the topic, but it's actually 
was very easy. The creating of the reading list is also challenging because practically you are creating the classics of citizen science. There, in practice, there was only a marginal flipped element where the students are expected to watch things online and then discuss in class. For some reason, it didn't work well, but the hands-on experience worked really well. And another lesson is that creating the course both as open and available uh, in class is a lot of work and it requires about three or four times more work than just class delivery in standard lecture. There is much higher standard in material preparation, which show itself when uh, the whole university shifted into online, as you will see it in a minute. And uh, the recording of talks also uh, is a complex task that needs to be thought about to keep it engaging. And it turned out to be very helpful because there were all kinds of incidents. So every year that the course has run, there was an element of using it online. So if you want to find more information, you can search for UCL Extend or New Citizen Science or the UCL MSc in Citizen Science. So thank you very much for uh, watching this and I hope that you learn something about the journey of teaching citizen science at UCL. Hope everyone enjoyed Muki's presentation and now it's the turn of Anne. Great, hi everyone. Um, I would say thank you to Muki, but um, he's not here. <laughs> um, I'll uh, share my screen shortly. Uh, yeah, I think it, it's a couple of things that I've been reflecting on while I've been listening to the great talks that have gone before me. I think it's really, oh, I'm gonna do Gemma's trick actually of setting myself a timer. <laughs> that would uh, be useful. Um, I think what really struck me was, it was great to have a broader context from Kirsty, but of course um, it's kind of shameful that I'm learning so much about other UCL colleagues work at an event or a webinar like UCL is such a, a behemoth of an, in, of an institution that it's really difficult to keep on top of what's happening and which is why thing, projects like this are so important um, and putting on these kind of events so yeah it's not just um, everyone else in the room that I would like to learn from I'm learning from my own UCL colleagues um, and that's definitely about complexity of the institution and complexity of language as well, because as Gemma mentioned, I was my project was never set up as digital action. Um, I haven't interfaced with the Open Science Office at UCL. And so there's lots of different language differences, but we all feel like we're kind of the same or there's certainly an overlap. And I think that's what's really important here. Um, and having said that, I don't know what anyone else is up to at UCL. Um, I think it's also important to say that I'm actually, I think it's a really nice note to make that I'm actually a graduate of the Evaluation Exchange. Um, I do know Gemma very well, Kirsty's a new friend, um, and I know of Mookie. Um, but yeah, I'm a graduate of Evaluation Exchange, and it was a completely transformational experience for me as an early career researcher, and all the great stuff that Gemma presented there today happened to me um four or five years ago and that's actually why I'm now doing the job that I'm doing which is what I'm about to present um some um learnings from so I completely shed my um traditional academic research cloak um and I've taken up an, a, a lovely brightly colored cloak of kind of community engagement and open science and citizen science and all these new words that kind of feel like they're all under the same umbrella so let me just share my screen. And again, let me know. I'll move us out of the way. Um, all good, thanks, Kirsty. Um, yeah, so again, whilst I'm not digital action, I did have a little, it, uh, these talks are really great to make you reflect on what you do, aren't they? Um, and I wanted to, I reflected on the fact that actually, some of the stuff that Gemma was saying there about what we've learned and how we've all shifted online in order to try and continue to be um, engaged practitioners, engaged research practitioners. Some of the digital things that I've been that have been 
uh, enforced and have been essential, um, have actually found their way into, my learning has found their way into kind of um, enhancing students' participatory practice by telling them what I've had to do to make my project happen to help them. So let's uh, start at the beginning. Um, so yeah, I run, uh, I run something called the Community Research Initiative. And as um, we're at a university that runs by an acronym, so I have an acronym um, and I'm known as CRIS or C-R-I-S. So I'll, I'll say CRIS from, from now on. And it's uh, the kind of central thing is that it's around community or social action um, being brought about through collaborative postgraduate taught dissertations. So it's co-curricular. So master's students doing dissertations anyway, and I work with them um, through kind of principles of open science, knowledge democracy, kind of curriculum decolonization, all those kind of nice things. I work with master students to help promote um, and support them to have a more inclusive kind of student research practice when they're doing their dissertation. Um, and I, I do that in, in a number of ways. And this is a horrible slide, I'm sorry. Um, but I haven't got my lovely visualization back from my marketing team yet. So at the moment, it's a table. Um, but essentially, in the most left hand column are all the kind of elements. I've, I've kind of built a service ecosystem, I suppose. And so there's no journey that a student takes. Um, there, it's a very user led ecosystem where students can pick up, it's not linear, they can pick up what they want to do and build their own journey towards a kind of collaborative dissertation. And that's also not my absolute endpoint metric. If a student has just thought about this and power sharing or there's expertise outside of the faculty and university, if they just think about that and come to one element of this ecosystem, to me, that's a, that's a win. So I kind of deliver this ecosystem brokering where I help students um, meet with um, voluntary and community sector organisations, not for profit charities whatever language um, you recognize from there. I do one-to-one -one coaching and advice to help with this kind of practice, uh, put on networking events, um, lots of co-design research, co-design events, um, support the knowledge exchange once a kind of little fledgling partnership has um, started, um, support any partnerships to go forward, support students to be reflective and build a community for them, et cetera, et cetera. So this happens through any one academic year for master's students. And what I started thinking about today, um, for today's session, sorry, was that through the kind of um, group environment of the skills development workshops, where I do four different workshops that you probably won't be able to see in that table, but I do a project management workshop. I do a communication skills workshop so active listening and creative storytelling we focus on. I do an introduction to participatory methods and I do a reflect and present session so that students learn to think about how to package up their experiences into job interview answers or grant application answers or, you know, to make you realise that you've, you've got the answers from your own experiences, right? Um, and then on the coaching and advice side, that's much more one-to-one -one and that's much more bespoke, but we still cover these kind of skills. The students just maybe want a bit more in depth or they want it to be less, um, they want it to be more granular and more specific to what they're doing. And so it's kind of through these one-to-ones that a new skill session has, has come about that we'll, I'll be delivering in the next academic year. And it really was about students wanting some support with their digital skills. And, you know, it was learned by us through necessity, as I said, because of COVID to continue the service. But actually what's, what's happened is that students and organizations actually have come to us asking for a bit of skilling up or help with using these platforms that we are very privileged as to having licenses at UCL and they all have free, um, you know, entry level free access. And so although um, 
these skills such as I have them were um, learned out of necessity actually I'm now turning them into a kind of um, digital skilling up offer that even with you know even with COVID disappearing and lockdowns disappearing I say that tongue-in-cheek but even with the world opening up to a bit more familiar than pre-COVID I think these digital tools are real enablers for collaboration anyway, even if we can be in person and face to face. As Gemma was saying, you know, it's, it's picking up the positives um, of what we've learned. So I found in my practice that the best digital rooms, the best replacements for being in, in the same place together was something called Gather Town. And I found that incredible for kind of those kind of initial meeting, networking, conversation, spacey kind of um, sessions that you might have done in, in person. And I really enjoyed using Remo as a kind of conference style space or a, a more co-production space as well. And I actually flipped an in-person student community event that was normally done in person with lots of kind of matching up activities I actually flipped it and made it entirely digital um, and it worked really well on Remo and once you're in there once you've got everyone in the digital rooms the best enablers that I, I've experienced which will be very familiar to you I'm sure Miro, Padlet, Jamboard, you know Slido, Mentimeter um, and what what came to me that I really wanted to talk you through today and, and well this is my last slide but what the culmination of today is, is that requests started coming in to share what I was doing. So, um, you know, to take the most, the purple, most right hand box there, I had a number of organisations come to me after both the Gather Town kind of um, breakfast meetings, kind of drop in and meet an academic type thing. Um, organisations emailed me afterwards to say, you know that was amazing I didn't I had no idea about Gather Town I've never heard of Gather Town you know I can't believe UCL's got this and I was able to email back and say oh but it's it's free to use you know I've just used it uh, that's my 10 minutes uh, I've just used it um, myself on a free license so I was able to talk a few organizations through using it and then there's two students there who both have come to me asking um how do I use Jamboard or Miro and they want to use it in terms of they're doing face to face work, but they're capturing live responses um, during kind of committee meetings um, in Charlie's instance there. And for Megan, um, there's a, the organisation can't do a site visit and it's really important to them to get the student in the space. So I've suggested to them, well, why don't I talk you through doing a mural board with a map of the space and you can do a digital walkthrough as a compromise to being there in person. So I'll feed back to you how that worked. Thank you very much. Thanks, Anne. And now our final speaker is Artemis. Thank you so much, uh, Abril, and thank you all the previous speakers for their very exciting and interesting talks. Just give me one second to share my screen. Can you see my screen? My presentation? Um, I'm not sure if you can see it, but I guess... Yes, we can. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, so in this uh, last part of our today's webinar, I will be talking about citizen science uh the digital divides and how you can address some digital exclusion barriers based on the lessons that we have learned from conducting extreme citizen science research projects all over the world in the last um 15 years i hope that people who work uh, on bottom-up digital action will we will find uh, our recommendations uh, useful so we've talked a lot about uh, citizen science with uh, Mookie's and Kirsty's presentation before, and here is a formal definition of uh, citizen science. So citizen science has been recently defined as a scientific work undertaken by members of the general public, often in collaboration with uh, or under the direction of professional scientists and scientific institutions. Um, citizen science uh, activities may take different forms and they may involve different audiences. For data hungry fields such as ecology, astronomy, 
Uh, this mainly involves hundreds or even thousands of participants who act as sensors, collecting data about specific species, which would be otherwise out of the reach of the scientific community, or they may further involve, again, hundreds or thousands of participants, analyzing some sort of data that would otherwise take scientists years to do it themselves. Um, then we have activities where people of all ages may be involved in some sort of uh, bio bleach or DIY citizen science and collect some form of environmental data. <clears throat> uh, we also have citizen science activities where some hundreds or maybe less participants in collaboration with scientists collect data to address local issues. Uh, examples here may include people collecting data about air pollution or noise pollution in their local areas to address uh, these issues and eventually influence relevant policy making. Uh, a growing number of citizen science activities um, focus also on engaging with indigenous, marginalized and underrepresented communities all over the world. Their purpose is again mainly to support these communities in addressing some sort of local issue um, and eventually find a solution. There are, however, significant uh, digital divides here. Uh, the successful implementation, therefore, of these initiatives requires a completely different way of thinking and a different approach to support their design so they are more inclusive towards a wider population with different characteristics. Um, I assume that all, not everyone uh, here uh, might have heard or known about the, what is the digital divide. Uh, so when the term digital divide was first used in the late 20th, 20th century, it was used to describe the gap between those who uh, had mainly access to cell phone devices and those uh, who did not. Since then, and with the wider uh, use of information communication technologies, the term is used to refer to the gap between um, specific demographics and regions that have access to a modern ICT and those that do not. There are many different barriers that prevent individuals and whole communities uh, from fully utilizing information and communication technologies. Um, we can identify, for, ex for example, the access divide, uh, which mainly refers to the socioeconomic differences among people and the impact on their ability to financially afford um, the device is necessary uh, to get online. The use divide, uh, which refers to the difference in the level of skills uh, that are possessed, the digital skills possessed, possessed by uh, individuals. Um, the quality of use uh, gap, which refers to the different ways that people use the internet and the fact that some people uh, are more, much more comfortable to get the information they need um, from, from it rather than uh, some others. Uh, here, here, of course, we have some essential barriers, for example, applications which due to their design might be hard to access or the reusability is so poor um, that people simply cannot complete what they're trying to do. Uh, motivation can be another barrier. Of course, there are still some people who are skeptical, do not trust, and generally do not feel comfortable using technologies of any kind. Um, and this, of course, this also has to do with the digital skills that people are equipped with or those that they, they are lacking. So who is most likely to be uh, affected? Um, digital divides exist between developed and developing countries, urban and uh, rural populations, young and educated um, versus older and less educated individuals, um, as well as men and women. Some social groups who are likely to be digitally excluded, particularly in the UK, include uh, people with disabilities, people on uh, low incomes, uh, people who live in social housing, and people, of course, who have fewer educational qualifications or who have left school before they were 16. Um, so the leave no one behind uh, is one of the six principles in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and its Sustainable Development Goals. It represents a commitment for all um, uh, UN member states to eradicate uh, poverty in all its forms uh, and the discrimination and exclusion and reduce inequalities and vulnerabilities that actually leave people behind and undermine the potential of individuals and the humanity as a whole. 
Citizen science as a practice is currently already contributing to a few uh, indicators of the sustainable development goals and has the potential to supplement uh, or directly contribute to over 100 uh, SDG indicators. Especially for bottom-up community-driven projects, citizen science is an important tool for contextualizing um, the sustainable development goals at a local scale and gives agency to local, um, to local people to act on issues that are important at the local level, but also who may which may have a global impact. So within the context of citizen science, there is a discussion of how to best address digital divides and ensure that no one is left behind. So in the next few slides, I will include some guidelines based, as I said, on our experiences from extreme citizen science all over the world. <clears throat> so the first, the first point I would like to make is that we do not think that all projects should include everyone. Uh, having a very wide outreach, which is usually the case with citizen science projects in the global north, which are trying to reach out to um, possibly everyone from the quadruple helix. It is complex, it requires a lot of expertise, it requires a lot of resources, and therefore can be quite expensive. Um, the stakeholder analysis is absolutely essential, not only the beginning, but at the various stage of project design and implementation. Logic models can also help to ensure that the right activities and the right outputs are generated in order to identify and engage with those that should be involved in a project, including, of course, marginalized and underrepresented communities, which might require some more targeted activities to be designed for them. To engage those who are less likely to participate, you need to make uh, a conscious effort to design relevant activities at relevant locations, but also provide tools that are easy to use uh, by these specific groups. Uh, do not assume that people will not be interested. They will. You just need to design your project in a way that takes into account their needs and expectations. Uh, for that reason, uh, try to reach out to those communities as early as possible and co-design activities with them. Uh, local organizations can, of course, help you get in touch with relevant groups or individuals. Um, another recommendation is that do not assume that an app can be easy to use or address specific accessibility requirements. So if you design a new application for your citizen science data collection, make sure that it adheres to accessibility principles and do a lot of usability testing uh, to ensure all target uh, audiences can successfully uh, utilize it. Uh, provide extensive training and support uh, and try to help build uh, digital skills more broadly. Um, if, for example, you use an application on a smartphone device to collect data, you need to not only train people uh, in terms of using that particular applic application, but you also have to train them uh, and subsequently support them in using smartphones in general. Uh, always have someone available to deal with downloading or app crushing issues. Uh, in terms of digital skills uh, that are important in digital action, take the time to show uh, to people how to search online, uh, how to use websites like Google Scholar to do some literature review search, help with other applications and tools that can be helpful for your uh, project in a broader context. Uh, and some lessons learned that uh, target mainly the global south. So for those who want to engage people from the global south and developing countries, uh, I would say that it is extremely important to know, to, to start with uh, an understanding that this may involve completely different cultural characteristics, political and economic challenges, uh, individuals and communities who have completely different trust concerns, especially when it comes to uh, getting engaged and participating in this type of projects. So you need a very good understanding of all these local conditions, the needs of local people, um, and they need to be from the very beginning until the very end, the, those that they will be driving the citizen science project. You also need to take into account that literacy skills and technological skills may vary significantly uh, from what we are used to in the Western world. For example, the communities that we work with in extreme citizen science are mostly illiterate or non-literate. So we need to develop tools that are completely text-free. 
Um, the fact that there is no electricity in some places means we need to come up with alternative solutions for charging uh, devices there. Um, also, the fact that some people's fingers are rough and might not be easy for them to use uh, touch screen uh, displays means we need to develop alternative uh, tangible interfaces and so on. That means uh, we are running out of time. So. Yes, I'm finishing um, in one second. So trust in the way it is established as part of our interpersonal relationships depends on cultural characteristics and past experiences. Uh, many geographic areas from the global south and their people suffered from the impacts of colonialism and therefore trust is either completely broken or it is very fragile. So you need to respect these communities first, build a common mutual, mutual understanding and trust uh, for any project to work there. There. And the last point uh, that I want to make in order to, uh, to build uh, trust is that um, you need to follow processes that fully respect local knowledges and place them right at the center of knowledge production, not as an add-on and definitely not based on the assumption that we know better. So going back to the first recommendation I have on the slide, co-designing the project with local community, as well as co-designing the structures and representations that are used by the technological uh, devices are absolutely essential to overcome these barriers. So thank you very much. Thanks, Artemis. Thank you, everyone. Thanks to uh, all the speakers and everyone for joining today's webinar.